why i guess in a nutshell is um to be able to work with very smart people and to work with those people that are passionate about what they do because if your work is out there and you're kind of working out in the open and all your conversations are reviewable and people can kind of get a sense of how you work and how you work with others and you see the problems that you have you're going to i think tr attract people that are interested in what you're doing and ultimately it's the fun part of being able to work with them. Hello friends, welcome back to Beam Voice. Today I have the pleasure to talk to distinguished guests whom I've been waiting for a long time to talk to because they are doing an amazing job for the open uh, source community, OSArch and the Blender Beam project. Maybe I see OpenShell as well, I'm not sure, but mostly Blender Beam, I guess. I'm talking about Ryan Schultz and uh, Bruno Pedigao de Oliveira. Tell us a few words about yourself. Let's start with Ryan and let's go from there. So yeah, I'm an architect by training. I've been practicing about 25 years or so. It's hard to keep track. I uh, did undergrad in architecture in Milwaukee, took two years off, worked for a firm uh, in Milwaukee there, and then went to grad school down in Georgia Tech in Atlanta and came back to Milwaukee thinking I was going to be able to work for my previous firm. They weren't hiring, it was the recession at the time. So I ended up having go, to go down to Chicago and I thought I was gonna be there for a year or so and then come back. I was down there 10 years, I'm working for a firm. Finally was able to make my way back to Wisconsin and so I'm in Madison now. So I've throughout my career, career I got into open source 11 years, 12 years ago. It started with like Second Life, if you, anyone remembers that, it's still around, surprisingly, kind of a virtual world. And I teamed up with John Bruchot, is his name, we started Studio Wikitecture. And basically, we tried to use Second Life as kind of a poor man's BIM tool. I don't know. Sorry, sorry. I don't know yep. what is Second Life. Second Life is a virtual world. It just started, was back in 2000. Yeah, it's it's basically a virtual world. You can, you can inhabit it. It's like met metaverse, basically. But it was the metaverse back when, you know, metaverse first came out and it, it still crashed <laughs> just like the metaverse a couple of years ago crashed. But anyways, we, we use second life as kind of a poor man's BIM tool. And, uh, we created a group called studio architecture and we worked on these projects together. And so, yeah, there's some fun projects that came out of that, but that kind of petered out. And a couple of years later, I was still interested in applying open source to architecture. And so I started opening design, which is basically an architectural firm that tries to uh, harness open source principles. And so for the longest time, I've been trying to use open source tools and, and all our projects are done out in the open, hosted on GitLab and GitHub. And so, yeah, here we are today. So that's kind of in a nutshell. But uh, you did not highlight enough a fact and uh, i'm talking about the fact that you are using open source tools on your projects but not only that you are also publishing your projects the projects you are working on right you are hosting you are having this in the open on uh, github yep yep we started with github the last couple of years we're using gitlab now it's basically the same thing as github but yeah we're using kind of git as a version tracking system and pushing all our files, BIM files, PDFs, you name it, everything basically in a typical project folder, right? And we're pushing to GitHub. Certain things are kind of sensitive that we encrypt. We still use the, the repo as the GitHub repo, but we encrypt files, uh, sensitive client files we push out there, but essentially everything is, is out there. Two quick questions about this before we go to Bruno. Why are you doing this? And the, the second one, how do you convince all your clients to accept this? Sure. Why, I guess, in a nutshell, is um, to be able to work with very smart people and to work with those people that are passionate about what they do. Because if your work is out there and you're kind of working out in the open and all your conversations are reviewable and people can kind of get a sense of how you work and how you work with others and you see the problems that you have, you're going to, I think, tr attract people that are interested in what you're doing. And ultimately, it's the fun part of being able to work with them. I think at the end of the day, it's it's all about finding 
an approach that allows the most freedom of working. And I think if history's any guide, the more free you are in terms of what you decide to do with your life, the most efficient way of doing it, right? And so we still, as a society, I don't think we found a way to really harness that like capitalism, but I feel if we do, that it's the most efficient way of working. So that's in a nutshell. And how to get clients to do it, that's been a, a fun little lesson over the years. I actually have a proposal, which is out there, like everything else, that gives the clients basically three tier options, fee tier options. They can The most economical one is the most open approach. Um, the middle tier is still open, but it's anonymous. Uh, you know, the project name and the consultants and the parties are, are kind of kept anonymous. And then the third is a more traditional approach and everything's, you know, proprietary and, and closed and whatnot. So the proposal gives the client the option. And so because of buildings typically from owner's perspective are not a core part of the business model for a business. And so they don't care about keeping it proprietary. And if you're a data center, they probably care about that kind of stuff, but majority of building owners don't care. And so our clients, 90% of them go for the full open approach. And so, yeah, that's, that's how. Interesting. Interesting. Very interesting. Okay. Now let's uh, go to Bruno. Come on, Bruno, tell us some stuff about yourself because me personally, you, uh, I don't know you too well. You work behind the scenes. You are doing magic behind the scenes. So I'm really, really curious to find out more about you. Hi, hi, Petro. So I'm an architect also. I've been practicing for like 11, 12 years now. And since I graduated, I started an architecture office. Uh, along with other three three friends and I worked with them for the like for the past 10 years I recently the, the name of the of the office is Hedge Architectus if anyone is interested and we had a, an office like a traditional approach of the way of work and workflows. And I left the, the office like one a year ago because I was trying to pursue a more a more tech career, like towards being tech. Uh, and I started to learn Python. I started to learn to pro, uh, programming. I'm also studying data science nowadays. And this is the point of my career where I'm trying to shift my career towards a more tech approach so i that uh, maybe this is because i, I <laughs> you see my work as behind the scenes because i'm i'm not fully there so i'm starting to like i started to to collaborate a little with blender being coach it's just small commits and, and stuff but i started this in this in the past few months working with Ryan, I also get the chance to, to write some scripts, to troubleshoot Blender Bean. And this is all uh, also a learning opportunity for me. And yeah, last I guess last year, Ryan made a, a post in the community talking about uh, a pos the possibility of a collaboration with Blender Bean. And I joined, I joined him in, in Open Design. And we, we, we have been collaborating since then. We have a small I had a small gap, but uh, I guess the past two months, one month, I, I don't know, we've been working on a few projects using only Blender Bean. It's been really, really awesome. So the, yeah, the reason to work out in the open to Petra is, is exactly that. With Blender Bean, obviously it's, it's alpha software. And so it's scary to use. It's scary to use on a real project, right? And so by conducting these projects out in the open, you can get help with certain things where it would totally devastate you if you if you didn't, if it was a close and it was just you, yourself, and I, and you know, one other person in the office, it wouldn't you couldn't do it. You know, you would run into brick walls all the time. And so it's a way to still harness Blender BIM and do it, you know, safely, I guess, <laughs> and, and develop the technology. So just a little thing about myself that I forgot to mention. I'm from Brazil. 
I'm from a, a town in Northeast called Fortaleza, and now I'm living in a near, relatively near town called Juazeiro do Norte. And one, one of the things, I'm glad that you asked those questions to Ryan, because I was curious to the why and how he managed to work in this, such an open manner. And this was something that, that I was really excited about when, when he, he talked about this possibility of, of collaboration. And it was very surprising to me to work like that, although I, I was expecting it. But when you work in such an open way, using Git for everything, it was, it was very, very surprising to me how, how it worked, worked well and for for every kind of file and it's been it's it's been a really really great experience i think about open source it's at least for me it's a different kind of pleasure when you get to work with those kind of softwares that when you have like a problem you can talk directly to the main developer and we are all trying to to improve we are all trying to get better it, it's a different kind of pleasure when you work alone and you work in all, all proprietary software i guess there is this feeling also that you are you are working with community that that it's very it's very nice yes ryan you wanted to say something yeah it feels like communities will eventually become the future companies because that's how people work the most efficiently. That's, they're joining these communities because they're passionate about it, you know. I think ultimately companies will start loosening up and start looking more like communities than, than you know, close companies. And so the one thing I was gonna bring up is that the whole trying to get clients onto the open approach is not easy. <laughs> it's not easy. Some people are, I'm sure I've lost contracts or people are scared off by that, which is fine. I'm okay with that. But I just just want to preface it. It's not necessarily easy to do it. But again, that proposal, it's out there. I can give it link to you. I've been working on it over years and years and trying to refine the approach and trying to hold the client's hand and allow them to understand the whole process. So what tools have you used before, guys, before Blender and Blender Beam? What was your uh, main tools you used? I worked a lot of, mainly with AutoCAD. And after AutoCAD, I used a little bit of ArchiCAD when I was doing a much more Bean approach. But, I, but I've always tried to use a little bit of open source, mostly for other works, like not for the, the, the project itself, but a little bit of Inkscape, a little bit of Krita, or GIMP, it was only now that, I, that I'm using uh, an open source software to, to actually using the whole process of designing and altering a being a being architectural project. What about you, Ryan? Revit, Revit guy? Yeah, many, well, started off obviously in AutoCAD. My first job was use Vectorworks. It was called MiniCAD at the time. It changed to Vectorworks in Chicago, we use MicroStation, an architecture firm that used MicroStation. That was kind of surprising. Later, got into Revit. That's kind of our main tool right now, unfortunately. You still using? You still using Revit? Uh, yeah. We need to make money, Petra. I'm just trying to understand, uh, like, is because you need to collaborate, you need to deliver Revit files, or you work more efficiently and you have everything, it's more reliable. It's yeah, still more efficient, uh, larger projects we do on Revit. Yeah, it's just at the end of the day, it's just more efficient. So yeah, the smaller project we do on Blender BIM, I'm sure we take a hit fee wise on Blender BIM. It's kind of, in my view, it's, it's the research part of uh, the budget. But I'm thinking about one aspect here and mainly I think Revit is more effect effective, uh, efficient. And yeah, of course it has a framework that works because you are modeling and then you are making drawings, right? And Blender Beam, it's like a patch to make the drawings. It's, you can do it, of course. Now we have the possibility to do it and so on, but it's not, it, it still does not work the same way at, as quick as possible as Revit does, right? Like after so many years of refinement and so on, right? But if you would not need drawings, if you would stop only at the model, do you still see, would you still see an advantage for Revit? 
if you just if you weren't even thinking about drawings at all and you were just thinking about modeling to judge it on that modeling and putting yeah putting the information instead of having on drawings all the information to be in the elements and the in the model itself so you can just extract the data just read it in a common data environment in something on your mobile and use that for to build for example well i guess first off you know that that meme that's been going on for years and years about trying to get rid of drawings <laughs> no i don't necessarily believe in that <laughs> it's first and foremost i don't think a drawing is a diagram and it will never get rid of diagrams you're distilling distilling information so anyways that aside it, on a pure modeling perspective i think blender blows away revit obviously uh what it, it can do in terms of imbuing it with data i think blender bim is is on par with revit but yeah you know again for drawings is such a large component of what we do or what i do i guess architects are more attached to drawings because i don't know i guess for for us the, the drawings are also a way of of think about the project it's not just a, a document that you deliver in the final process we like to use the drawing in the process but in blender b it's it's a little it's a little different because like in in Havage, in, in archicad you can work with a drawing like view but in blender b as it is right now we mostly do the 3d modeling and generate the drawings after. For me, I, I think it's 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 a little better because we focus on the 3D, on the, the details, on, on how things actually work together. But I still like to check the drawings to it's a better way to like, for example, when you see a floor plan, it's a better way to understand how these spaces are connected, the proportions, uh, and this, this kind of stuff. The drawings, I think they, they, they still have a, a meaning for the process, not only not only as a final product, but for the process also. Well, you know, architects work in different ways, but for me, well, in Revit, I basically work in 2D drawing view mostly. And with Blender BIM, I do that as well. I work in 3D, but typically take a lot of sections and elevations and, and work in that way as well. Can you do that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you set up the, the drawings, the Blender BIM drawings, just like Revit drawings. You can kind of flip between them. And so, yeah, I use that to, to design a, a lot as well. Um, in vanilla Blender, I don't, I think that's a, a foreign way of working. I think it's more just actually in 3D uh, constantly, but Blender BIM allows you to do that. You said something interesting. You, you still see the value in drawings. And I understand like using like drawings as a final uh, documentation or final product and to use them while designing. I think this is also a paradigm shift because Bruno, as you said, we've been taught in schools and this is the practice, the daily practice, right? Like this is how we design buildings and this is what we need, right? But there is also something else here. If you don't have clients that are demanding, if you have only clients that are demanding drawings, you'll always think like that. But when you start to be in a space where the clients are demanding 3D models, they don't need your drawings anymore. They cannot, they don't want to pay you to make drawings. Use that time and put that information in the model instead because they will not use the drawings. This is what's happening in Norway. I know, Ryan, I don't know about the meme, but I'm telling you something. Like in, in Norway, it, this is happening. Like all the clients are just requiring only for the models. And the, now the, my challenge, like not, not a challenge, but what I'm thinking right now, I'm thinking how, what is the right information that I need that usually was on the drawings? And how do I get that from the designer in my models? So I can use it to order materials, to take quantity takeoffs and to build after right this shift is happening right now it's a it's a, a paradigm shift like i said but this will not change until there will be someone who will require this and i completely agree there will still be drawings always will be some diagrams it doesn't make any sense to have them i don't know maybe at some point will be will encode or something i have no idea 
but there are things that make sense to be there. But because before even the 3D model uh, software, right, we had this mindset that we start everything from a drawing, right, from a plan, from a, some elevations, some sections and so on, right? But now when you don't see, don't, don't have that need anymore, if you need better data, more enriched data that you can use. And by the way, Bruno, you don't really like during the design process, you can also use maybe even Blender Beam works, but I don't know if it works so well to just, maybe you can, if you are working with Blender Beam, it could make sense to use another tool, like I don't know, Solibri or Beam Collab, the free version just to see views, right? Because if you take a section or uh, something is the same like a drawing, just is not annotated, right? You see the same thing. But what I'm trying to say here is that this change is actually happening. And I understand like, you will not be able to see and understand this until the entire environment or the industry will will push towards that direction. And I don't know how long it will take, but I see like all, in all the projects, most of the projects, my company starts to work to be done. There are no drawings anymore, uh, requirements for drawings. And all the big actors in Norway, the private ones who are building a big infrastructure project are have declared that in a few years they plan to work now it's called model-based design and building and uh, so this is this is happening but again can i ask you though that that do your the clients are not demanding drawings but in the pipeline of ultimately getting something built do they use that model to sometimes produce whatever fabrication drawings to convey to whoever who whoever's building at the time you need to do X, Y, Z. Hey, look at this. This is important. You should do this. So, you know, those are kind of diagrams essentially coming from the model that they are kind of drawings in a sense that are just, they're refining down those important parts that you're trying to convey to whoever's ultimately going to build that thing. You know, I don't know. Yeah. And, and just, just to make myself clear also, yeah, I, I guess this is a good thing. I, I, I don't know if it's if it's like, a, oh, drawings are, there's not going to be any drawings anymore. But that everything is going to the 3D model. All the information are going to the 3D model. And if you need a drawing, it will be automatically, that information will be automatically uh, come from the 3D model. This is a great thing. This is something that we try to achieve. In Blender B, in, in, in IFC it, it is it's great for that also. Yeah, but I, I guess I agree with Ryan that in a sense that we also we will always need some kind of drawing capabilities from the software because rather it's for a, a process something in the process or, or to refine a detail or to like if some kind of specific information that we we are trying to achieve. That, that was what I was trying to say. I think I think this is the reason why the industry has changed a bit from defining drawing less to model based because uh, it was a debate uh, in I remember this year in a few meetings I've been some conferences exactly about this because yeah there are some you will have some drawings but the objective the goal is to use mostly the model for all the parts of the project until the maintenance and the yeah, operation of the project because yeah you you have the data you can use it it's not that on a on a document somewhere right and sometime maybe ai will help us get quicker there where we can uh, harvest and use smarter uh, the data for this uh, but uh, again this is not happening overnight i'm saying like i've seen like this big uh, norwegian client public client aims for 2025 to have only model-based projects and this takes time and again if it takes time in a small country like Norway where everyone aligns to uh, towards this effort right then to if people later or after that will see any value in this and uh, will try to implement them as well then it will take even longer of course uh, the thing is is it good or bad we don't know I think we'll find out but I'm I'm quite convinced that is the right direction to go that would be, if that's not the case, that would be the, the biggest gambling took, taken by a, by a country. And But it's not only Norway, that's the thing. There are other, other countries as well. 
So yes, uh, but that's not necessarily the case. Maybe for smaller projects, maybe uh, there is a there must be a threshold where it might uh, be any value in actually putting the information in a model instead of uh, having drawings or yeah, just modeling it. Right? Maybe you don't need even drawings, but yeah, small projects. I guess it's a good case for not go too crazy about with smaller budgets and so on. Uh, but uh, yeah, let's leave this behind and now let's discuss about other things. Are there any other open source projects that you are using in your projects outside uh, of OpenBIM? Yes, Ryan, you can talk a little. Speckle? Uh, no, I don't use Speckle. Again, you know, our projects are small and so uh, Speckle is, I feel like is more of a, for a larger project and you're coordinating with a lot of people. Yeah, I use like a screen capture open source tool called ShareX. It's Windows based. I also use um, a real time web based whiteboard called First Draft. It's on GitLab or it's on part of uh, the OS Arch um, open source software list there. Recently, we just started using a, a, another web based uh, whiteboarding tool called TLD Draw or something like that. Same functionality as First Draft. That, that seems pretty nice, pretty promising. There might be more, but nothing off the top of my head. And Matrix and Elementary, Elementary. Oh, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, it's, that that's a true testament to um, how useful it is if you forget about it. Um, yeah, the Matrix ch chat channel that o OS Arch uses as well, um, that's open source. And I think it's also the protocols too are open and that's a promising technology for sure. Yeah. What do you think about other people interested in doing this, especially people from countries where it's not so easy and so cheap to buy a Revit uh, license? Would you encourage them to try Blender BIM? What are, should they be afraid about that? Yes, very afraid. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, of course, yes, of course. I think there's a lot of opportunity there. I think there's a lot of opportunity with Blender BIM, regardless of the country you're in. Obviously, it's an alpha right now. You're going to get cut. You're going to bleed. But that's what the OS Arch community is all about, kind of holding hands through the storm, so to speak. I think it's, you know, Blender BIM is at a point now that, yes, you can use it for smaller projects. There is still some headaches there. But if you get, you know, pretty efficient at it, you have to, you have to be a power user at this point for it to really be, you know, a uh, return on investment, so to speak. It's getting there. So, how do you become a power user? How much time should somebody expect to invest to not to uh, 10 years like you to get to the level you are at right now, but to be able to use it for real? Yeah, you know, I think with the Lloyd, Lloyd's IFC Architect YouTube videos, which I highly recommend, I think if you go through watching those, I think you can be pretty proficient, you know, quickly. They're, um, or we work with a Regis, is his name, many years with him. He knows Blender and he just recently has started to learn Blender BIM. And we're st starting a new, new process, another newer project. And I, I feel he'll pick it up pretty quickly. We'll see though. So, so I feel comfortable enough where someone that is not in the depths of knowing IFC and in the depths of programming can pick it up. Yeah. Bruno? When I was working um, with my other other friend, my associates, I was the guy that was always, oh, let, let's take a look at this software. Let's, let's, let's make this in another way. Let's, I was always curious about what softwares or what, what different process I could use to make that faster, to make that better. And one thing that I always told them is, is that when you are using, uh, when you, every time you are going to use a new software, there is there is kind of a, a commitment that you have to have, you know, and you spend some time understanding how it works, and you spend some time until you feel like things get more natural for you using it. it it's a process that may take. It, it, will always, it, will, it will always take some time to get used to how that software works. And usually in open source, 
people that are not open source fans like like ourselves uh, they they already start using the software with a negative perspective i think i think that's a any software learning any <laughs> new software but but you're right though alpha software open source is a, a, the hurdle is a little higher yes yeah, yeah it's because it is a little a little hard but now, now talking about specifically Blender and Blender Bean, I guess the best way is to follow IFC Architect tutorials because you, you already get in practice, get to practice like a, a small project and, and you, you, you can see how it works. But there is a challenge that Blender Bean is, there's a, a specific system for Blender Bean that is inside Blender. And maybe it's it's also good to learn a little bit about Blender, but Blender Beam works in a different way inside Blender. It's a bit difficult to understand in, in the beginning, but once you 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 understand, oh, this is a Blender Beam specific. Oh, this I can do with a general Blender tool. This I can do. This is better if I do with a specific Blender Beam uh, tool. Once you understand that, I guess it's pretty much easy to, to work with. And also, there, there are the problems of an alpha software. It's still in development. But I feel now that I guess I, I could summarize this as Blender Bean is already capable of doing almost everything we need. Not everything in an easy way, the most you demand from it. That's, that's the beauty. Of, of open source and there's no ceiling right that's that's the attraction there's no ceiling of what you ultimately can do it's that if you have an idea and are passionate enough about it you can create that tool or tweak whatever uh you can make it customized to your workflow one thing i you know i would like to convey to anyone that's ultimately watching watching this and wanting to learn blender bim is to really harness the os arch community and don't not be afraid to ask dumb questions. I think I think a lot of new users are afraid to ask silly questions on OS Arch because a lot of the conversations that are are pretty deep. But yeah, that's what it's there for. And again, you got to start somewhere, and that community is great for that. So I would highly recommend it. I really need to comment this because I will forget otherwise. But you said you said something interesting, and I will said something that actually changed my life. And the reason why we talk today it's because of that dumb questions. In 2018, I was working in a job, and uh, I was afraid. I had already some quite vast experience, but this I did never work with formwork, you know. And I was working in this company renting out formwork, and. I was very unsure to ask uh, questions that might sound dumb, right? Simple questions, let's say simple questions, right? And I will never forget this. My boss, my leader in that time, he told me this, like, Petro, there are no dumb questions. There are only dumb answers, you know? And this is the thing that I repeated in my mind also when I started this podcast, because I did not have any experience when I started this podcast about making a podcast or I did not have a good network, a great network. I did not, I never tried to ask anything from anyone in my LinkedIn network or just contacting people out of the blue. I was not comfortable with this. And I always remember that there, there are no dumb questions. So as long as I believe and I think this, it doesn't matter, right? Uh, and uh, yeah. Sorry, ultimately too, those questions are very informative to the future development of the program too, because you have someone's coming in with preconceived notion of using another tool. I'm trying to do this X, Y, Z, Y, you know, that is a use case right there in, in terms of making it easier the next time. So that's invaluable as well. Yeah. Sorry, Bruno. Now you can go ahead. Oh, uh, the only way to become a power user is becoming a user <laughs> first. Yeah. And then you start asking, asking, asking. And I'm starting to get a perspective now because I, I started to play around with the, the Blender Bean code and, and I'm starting to understand some of the code. And I'm starting to get these two perspectives from the user and from the developers. 
because I started to develop a specific feature for Blender Bean, it's like to, to duplicate IFC aggregates. And Ryan started to test and, and he, he, he started to asking for things that I, I wasn't thinking. So this is good for the developers. One of the things that we have to understand as users, uh, the more questions, the more we, we use and, and see the flaws of the, of the softwares. This is good for the developers because they, they are going to, to understand what in what they, they should work on, what, what, what they, should, they should improve in the code. So, so yeah, maybe, maybe when you enter OSR community, you see a lot of technical questions and, and it might be a little overwhelming, but it's, I, I learned a lot with Ryan, I, I guess Cohen also asks a lot in, in, in the community and maybe when you get there, you kind of, you may be kind of overwhelmed, but this is the way you, you have to ask and put yourself out there. Yep. The nice thing too is OSR, it blurs the distinction between a user and a developer, right? It's like there's people that start as users, you know, power users, and they start, you know, be learning code and becoming kind of novice developers themselves. And so it's not, you know, clear distinction between user and, and developer. It's kind of blurs those lines and the way it really should be, you know? Mm. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yes, uh, sometimes, not sometimes, very often myself, I feel uh, overwhelmed in that chat. Like there is a lot of things, there are a lot of things that I don't understand. And, but is that how you learn, right? And also Blender B is kind of a Swiss knife for, for being. So there are, there are questions that maybe engineers that build bridges and tunnels make, make sense for them and, and others like for architects that work in small projects, other topics might be interesting. Interest. So, so it's it's very broad, and when you when you realize that, no, oh, I don't I don't need to understand everything that is that is being discussed here. Yeah, I understand. Makes sense. Makes sense. How far away are we of the beta version of Blender Beam? Do you have any idea, any feeling regarding this? Actually, John talked about this in a recent post in the community I, I i i don't i don't remember the title of the post but actually he he's, he told that the bet it's in a stage now that calling it better it's like a community call yeah, you know if if the community thinks it's better we should call it better there's no like a a clear line where you say now it's a better and and also because of, of those many capabilities of, of Blender Bean, like if you work with like schedule, cost management, maybe it's more advanced for, than for us that are working with drawings, this kind of stuff. So it, it's, it's a little bit hard because in a way it's already better, it's already better. But in some other ways, maybe it's still an alpha because it's a very, very, powerful tool it's very broad i don't know maybe it, 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 i think it's very very close i ultimately think it doesn't really matter <laughs> no. those alpha beta whatever what about 1.0 what about 1.0 then 1.0 is is different for, for everybody it's getting to the point put it this way it's good enough to use on small projects if you're an architect and that's my my experience right it's going to be a little painful. You're going to bleed a little bit. It's getting there. So, and calling it like 1.0 when the time comes, it's also a way to like to tell everyone like we 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 hit a major milestone and the software is ready. Maybe some users might feel more comf comfortable when it's called 1.0 or maybe. Okay. What can we do, everyone watching this or listening to this, can we do to get involved or uh, to help the, these projects? Funding, contributing code, pushing bug issues. The one thing I do think would be nice to accelerate development is, is funding, to tell you the truth. And if you could just go to like our blenderbim.org, um, there's a funding 
you know, length there. And that's, I think, the easiest right out of the gate thing to do. Because right now, the current funding they have, I think Dion's able to support one developer. And just that one developer, you can see, is making a big difference in terms of how, how much it's accelerated development. Yeah, that may, that's, a, that's probably the biggest thing someone can do that's the easiest right now. Yeah, because th there are a lot of, of developers that work on Blender Beam as um, when they have the time. And so we're funding, uh, yeah, if we had like three to four developers like essentially working only on Blender Beam, it would accelerate things a lot. And another thing that, that recently when the videos from my FC Architect in YouTube, I guess it showed like how much that was that was needed and no one was doing that that way like like he has done now like showing showing like the the altering capabilities of blender bean and so just use spread the word <laughs> and it's something that we can see like with the blender community itself like when blender i started using blender when they released like the 2.2.8 version that was, they, they had a major uh, refactoring in the UI and a lot of things. And a lot of tutorials and YouTube tutorials, and it, it was really easy to find resources about Blender. So although Blender was a little hard to, to, to learn, and I had the resources, resources to learn, and this is also something that anyone can do, like writing documentation, making videos, making posts in social medias, and this kind of stuff is also very helpful. Yeah, yeah that's true. It's uh, most of these things don't take a lot of time and yeah, you can uh, have a big impact. Is there anything like this questions, question is for each of you. Like Ryan, do you feel that is anything that important we did not cover that you would like to say? Not off the top of my head, I guess. Yeah, I think, yeah, the funding part, I think, is is important, actually, now that I, we're talking about it. If you ultimately believe in open source software and think it's, at the end of the day, is the most efficient way of working, and you think, oh, it's not quite there yet, it can get there quicker, I guess, with, with, with you know, people that help with, with funding. There is a little issue with that, you know, not a lot of people in AAC are aware about open source or know, or uh, like they are uh, burning for uh, open source, you know, uh, and uh, there are two, two problems here, problems or two issues why I think we should look for other ways to earn some money for these uh, projects. Uh, and one is the, that one that uh, not a lot of people are aware about uh, open source. And the second one uh, is not as easy to donate, not in all the cultures, as when you pay for something and you get something in return and you know that you also contribute to a project. So that's why I, I've been thinking about different ways, how to uh, run some stuff, some, some, I don't know, that can finance the projects, you know. I have some ideas for the future. I don't know what is going to end up. I don't want to make any promises, but I have some ideas uh, because yeah, there are people who are comfortable to donate and that's fine. They are doing already or they will do, come and do it, right? But other people are not. But they will uh, be able to pay like $50 for, I don't know, a course or something that goes and funds the project, you know? So I've been thinking about this, but I, I'll like it's still in a concept phase because I think this is also an issue. Yep. Bruno, is there anything else you have on your heart you, I did not ask you about? Well, yeah, mostly I agree with Ryan, well, what he said about funding. And one of the things I, I, I yeah, that, that, I, that I thought is working with open source software, at least from, from my perspective as an architect and using that tool to develop, to, it, it's the tool you use to, to accomplish your, your job, your work. And a lot of times I felt trapped in softwares that I didn't like, softwares that I I felt like I had to use and they, that they were were not the kind of software that I was trying to, that I thought that was the best option for my job. I just used it because it's a market standard and those kind of stuff. 
And with Blender Bean, I feel like I can talk about how the two should work. It's more like the two and the process of designing. They are more related than just to have to accommodate my design process into a software that doesn't... I don't know if my, if I'm making myself clear, but it's, it's more like I feel like Blender Bean, I can work the way I want in some cases. And that's that's that, that freedom that comes with open source. The freedom word is used a lot in open source software, but it's also like this freedom to work the way I want as an architect. This is also a, a very good feeling that comes with working with open source software. Yeah, for, for me, it's it's just more about efficiency. If you can live in a world where everyone can decide what they want to do and tackle the problems that they want to do, which open source ecosystem in general allows that, we haven't been able to really center a, an economy around it, like, you know, capitalism, essentially. But it's obviously a way for humans to work on those things that are interest them and it's the most efficient way of doing it. So it's only a matter of developing a, a system by which we can all do that. You know, it, it will happen. <laughs> it, you know, it will happen. You just, companies will get looser and looser and looser and looser and um, they'll start looking more like communities than, than companies. I could be wrong though. Who knows? Yeah. Okay, guys. I think we can wrap it up. Thank you very much for joining me. I really appreciate you coming in and keep up doing the great work you do and keep sharing because yeah, what you do is inspiring and uh, I hope more people uh, will try to implement this and uh, dare to challenge the way they work and try to, to use this tool in their workflows, especially people working in smaller projects or in a, for a specific scope of work. Yep. Ask dumb questions. Cool. Thank you very much. Well, thank you.